land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship, supplies or intermediate goods, everything that gets used to make this product we'll refer to as inputs and the garden ornaments that get produced we'll refer to as outputs. For the Blaka marker, these inputs are the buildings, the machines, iron rods, the workers, even the lights and water. The output is the range of garden ornaments they produce. The process that changes inputs into outputs is called the production process. And to describe this process, we're going to make use of something called the production function. The production function shows us the maximum amount, the maximum output, a firm can produce with different combinations of inputs. The total output of a business, everything it produces, is called the total product, or TP. Inputs can be classified as either fixed inputs or variable inputs. Things like the buildings and the capital, that's all the heavy equipment and machinery, are what we call fixed inputs. They can't be changed overnight, quickly or easily. These fixed inputs generate the fixed costs of production that we looked at earlier. Costs like rent, rates, interest payments on loans and so on. Other inputs, like the iron rods and the labourers employed, are called variable inputs because they can change fairly quickly and easily. It's these inputs that are behind the variable costs. The difference between these two types of inputs is important because the amount of fixed inputs affects the firm's freedom to make quick or flexible production decisions in the short run. The difference between a fixed and a variable input is really the difference in the speed at which a firm can change that input. OK, so now we know that firms can change variable inputs quickly. If Blakemarker wants to produce more ornaments, they need to buy more iron rods and employ more workers. They can pick up the phone, order them, and probably have them available the very next day. Fixed inputs, however, are not so easy to change. They could build a new factory, but that could take some time. They might have to secure new loans and investment, arrange to sell this factory, find and buy a new piece of land, contract an architect, then a builder, and then, well, you get the idea. It could take months or even years. And that's why, when we look at production, we consider two different time periods. The short run is any period of time in which at least one of our fixed input factors cannot be changed. For instance, the size of the building or the capital equipment. The long run is any period of time in which the firm can change any of the inputs, including the fixed inputs. Decisions a firm makes about the long run are called planning decisions. In the real world, production functions are very complicated things. And to try and understand these complexities, we're going to use some of that old economist magic and make some simplifying assumptions. For now, we'll only deal with the short run. In other words, we will assume the fixed inputs do not change and ignore them for the time being. Now, the law of diminishing returns. This law was one of the first, and is still today, one of the most important tools we can use to understand and plan the production function for any type of business. To understand the production function, we first need to understand the law of diminishing returns. This famous law was established by a Frenchman, Anne-Robert Jacques Turgot, who lived between 1727 and 1780. We'll just call him Turgot. He was one of the pre-eminent economists of the 18th century, a French Adam Smith, if you like, although his work preceded Smith's Wealth of Nations by about 10 years. Many historians believe that if the French king Louis XVI had listened to Turgot instead of firing him, the French Revolution may never have happened, and the king might have avoided his abrupt comeuppance. The law of diminishing returns states that as more of a variable input is used in the production process while the fixed inputs stay the same, each additional unit of the variable input will eventually produce less and less additional output. 
In economic language, the marginal product of the variable input declines. Many of the gloomy predictions made by economists during the 20th century were based on this law. They thought, well, agricultural land is a fixed variable, but the population keeps growing, more and more labour is working this fixed limited land, and because of the law of diminishing returns, the additional food produced by each new farm worker is going to get less and less. Oh my word, sacré bleu! Starvation will follow, life will be brutal and shot. It wasn't a very hopeful picture. Fortunately, these predictions did not materialise due to new methods and innovations in technology in the agricultural sector.